Scott and Jamie, thanks again and take it away. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Thank you uh, for your time and coming today. Uh, so just a quick introduction. Um, so I'm Scott, I'm a Cal Engineer at G Research. My primary focus is working on um, OpenStack and uh, yeah, Ironic. Jamie? Yeah, hi, uh, Jamie Paul. So I'm a manager of a team here called Compute Platform Engineering and we're responsible for all things Kubernetes and our batch compute farms. Uh, so just a little bit on G Research. Uh, so we're a fintech company based in London. We run uh, and build large distributed research platforms for our quantitative researchers. And we're in this migration period from um, HC Condor and Windows over to Linux and Kubernetes that runs on top of OpenStack. So I'll dive a little bit into um, our Ironic. So OpenStack, um, Ironic, what is it? Obviously, this is the, the bare metal six. I'm not going to teach people to suck eggs, but uh, what is it? So Ironic um, is an integrated OpenStack service which aims to provision bare metal machines instead of virtual machines. Um, Ironic also supports vendor specific plugins which implement additional functionality such as moving between machines between different networks. And then an Ironic machine has four main states. So this is enrolling, enrolling cleaning, holding, and provisioning. So how does this work? This is purely like for us, this is how um, Ironic works within G Research. So Ironic uses IPMI and Pixie and a RAM disk image, uh, which is a microkernel in order to turn on and off the uh, machines. And then um, it, it will do that at various different stages of the build. And then Neutron will move the server to different networks using the network and generic switch plugin. We use that quite extensively. And then when a bare metal machine is deleted by the user, um, it's cleaned and then it's returned into the available pool for reuse. And then we have this um, kind of strategy to kind of build everything, um, rebuild everything once a month. It's around about every 28 days. Uh, servers will go into the farm and they'll be, um, they'll be used, drained, handed back, cleaned, and then they'll become available again for someone to use. So at a really high level, this is kind of the architecture. So on the left there, you've got um, Collar Ansible and Jenkins, which orchestrates um, the deployment of uh, Ironic. And then uh, that sort of fans out into lots of different conductor groups. So we make quite quite big use of uh, conductor groups uh, within GR and we, we tie them to things like availability zones and, and uh, that kind of thing. So it gives us quite a nice scalable way. We have up to about a thousand machines on a, on a single, well, on a pair of uh, conductors. And then um, say in a data center, if you had three AZs, you would generally have like three uh, sets of conductors um, and then each one would look after an AZ, um, an AZ set of machines. And then if that was a scale out more than sort of a thousand machines, then it's quite easy for us to just spin up more conductor groups and then we can tie resource classes over to those conductor groups. And then, um, that, yeah, keeps everything sort of ticking along. So uh, in order to get machines into Ironic, they have to go through this uh, enrollment uh, phase. And this is all orchestrated using Ansible, uh, using basically, uh, what they called uh, custom playbooks within Kyobi. Uh, so they go, first of all, they go through this pre-inspection. So we create a record of the machine in the Ironic API. We set the resource class. We apply some baseline file settings and then finally some baseline ILO config. Then what we do is we switch the machine on and we go through our Ironic inspection. So this allows us to turn the machine on, discover what's there, uh, check for any cabling issues, and then identify where it is plugged in on the switch. Um, and then we can go and create a port within Ironic um, to actually represent that node. So this bit's quite important what we, uh, where we um, kind of have to use inspection rules here to identify where the server's plugged in. Um, and then that helps us to know that there's not any cabling issues or anything like that, because if we come back and we have an issue and we need to troubleshoot it with the networking team, we need to make sure that our assumptions of where things are plugged in are correct, because they're going to be setting up um, at TCP dumps or whatever on on certain switch ports and we want to make sure that, that that's all correct and we're actually um, yeah, doing things as expected. So now that we've gone for inspection, um, we have enough information in Neutron to go and actually move the machine. So it will it'll first be on like a holding or provisioning VLAN, which will do the inspection and then Neutron will then move it over to cleaning. And then we go for a full cleaning cycle. And what that does is it updates the firmware um, ver verifies ILO settings and this basically makes sure things haven't been tampered with. And then we set the hardware clocks, uh, configure RAID, 
wipe the hard disks, and then we can do other things like checking GPU health. And it's quite extensible. You can do it as much as you want, really. That I don't think it's probably not a full list of everything it does, but um, yeah, it's, it's pretty extensible. We can do lots of different things in there. Uh, once it's gone through a clean, um, a full clean cycle, we know that the machine for its inspection rules is what we expected and it works because we've cleaned it or works up to a clean. Then what we can do is we can run to burn in tests. Um, so there we're burning like the memory, the CPU, uh, and the disks, uh, just to basically make sure that the hardware kind of works um, under a bit of pressure because we kind of go for the, um, the process of trying to fail as quickly as possible because it's, it kind of was, the further you go down the line through the pipeline, the more kind of expensive in terms of engineering effort it is to get the machine out of the way uh, if there is a fault with it. So running the burning test is kind of a good way to do that. And then finally, we go and create an instance onto the onto the server. So you might ask, well, if we've run burning tests and we put an OS in there and we've run some programs, why do the instance? Well, it's kind of, it's, it's a final test. And what it does is it actually moves the server onto like a tenant VLAN. We provide a, provide a VLAN and that's where uh, the user will actually go and select where they want the machine to be placed. So everything we've done up till now has all been on the, the provisioning and the holding and um, those kind of VLANs where they, it will, its final step is to move actually what a user will see. And then that helps us just um, iron out any last little issues that we might have. And also um, with network and generic switch, most of the things like are done on the on just the A side of the switch. Like it, it creates a pixie port. And that's just on that's all done on the A side. So creating an instance, we get we get a full bond, and then that allows us to basically just verify that everything's happy. So that server will just come up, um, and then we wait for Node Explorer to come up on there, and then we kind of say, well, "Yep, you're healthy." And then we just trash the machine, and then Neutron will go and destroy it, send it for a clean, and then it will put it onto the holding state uh, holding VLAN, and then that becomes available for the for the end users to to consume. So then we move on to like a deployment sort of phase. So this is kind of a representation of what a user will see. So on the left there, on the top left, you've got like a, a human um, that represents Jamie in this case. Um, so here make uh, a pull request into Git and then here specify things like flavors, networks, AZs, images. And then that will move over to the right there, go through Nova into Ironic and fan out into other services like Glance and Neutron to move the ports. And then yeah, out the other side comes a bare metal node. So if we just go through that step by step, so the user requests a bare metal machine via Terraform, and then the flavor that they select uh, maps to the resource class, and then the network and availability zones maps to a location in the data center of where the image is, where the server is going to be placed. So this is kind of important because the, the resource class basically represents like a type of server. And then, so you could say, I want a GPU server of type X, and then that'll, that'll be represented in a flavor that that Jamie would have access to or whoever the customer is. And then um, you, the, we have quite a large estate, so you don't want the machine just ending up just in a random rack. So you can basically say, I want it to be in this availability zone and on this network, and then that will tell the scheduler exactly where it needs to be placed. So then, yeah, the placement service uh, will yeah, pick, a, pick a node from the available pool. Neutron will move it to the provisioning VLAN, and then we go through the machine provisioning phase. Um, so what happens here is Ironic uh, Conductor will turn the machine on using IPMI, pixie view it into the deploy RAM disk, apply some custom BIOS settings using deploy steps. So that will turn things like hyper-threading on or off or any kind of custom settings that the user might have. Um, and then we pull the images, the user's image down from Glance, and then Neutral and remove the machine over to the, the VLAN that Jamie selected or the user selected, and then the server's restarted. And then once that comes up, that will boot then into the OS of the, the selected um, um, one from the user. So then what we have is we have everyone has a bare metal machine and they're all happy. And then that's not where the story ends though. So at the end of the 30 days, um, the, the user will delete the server or in Terraform, you can taint the resource. And then Neutron will serve, move the server back to the cleaning VLAN. We'll go through that full cleaning cycle and then Neutron moves it to the holding VLAN and then it becomes available again. So it's basically gone in a full circle. And then um, that means that when machines are coming in from enrollment and being handed back, the kind of end state, when they go into available, they, they kind of look exactly the same. So there I can hand over to Jamie to talk a little bit about uh, Kubernetes that runs on top of Ironic. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so I'll take it from here. This will be more around how we 
use these ironic servers within Kubernetes and then a little bit about what we actually use those for. So yeah, we have a process for cluster bootstrap where we uh, build a minimal Kubernetes cluster. So we have uh, a bunch of Terraform um, configured in GitHub, Terraform configuration, which basically is used to instruct OpenStack to create a collection of machines, in this case, um, bare metal ironic machines. Uh, and they are brought online with a very minimal Kubernetes configuration applied via ignition. Um, this is because we use the flat car operating system and that's its way of bootstrapping itself. Uh, if you move to the next slide. At that point, we have a sort of vanilla Kubernetes cluster with a selection of nodes, maybe a relatively small number to start with. Um, what we then do is apply our full Kubernetes configuration um, via a Jenkins pipeline. So at the moment, this is quite sort of push-based where we basically have our uh, I guess our cluster management system, which is aware of what Kubernetes clusters we have in the organization and what various settings they should have. It then goes ahead and applies uh, effectively a whole bunch of YAML, which um, applies the different components which we put on our Kubernetes clusters to make them look and feel like our users are expecting. So uh, things such as cert manager, ingress controllers, all that kind of stuff, which just makes them sort of, I suppose, uh, GRified. Um, also a note here, we're, we've got a migration at the moment to move away from this sort of push-based model um, being driven by Jenkins and more to a sort of pool-based, constantly reconciling, reconciling model using Argo or Argo CD, in fact. Um, and you can move on. And then what we typically use all of this for, in fact, is to build a whole bunch of Kubernetes clusters, which we then put our application called Armada on top of. So the reason we're actually using all this bare metal compute is because as a company, we do a lot of... Um, uh, research. Our researchers basically run a large amount of run to completion batch jobs. They need the highest performance they can get um, using getting the most out of the hardware that we have. So to do that, we provision Kubernetes clusters on bare metal, make all the resources available to people, and then enable them to use it through this software called Armada. So Armada, which I've done different presentations about, I don't know if any of you have seen it possibly, um, is effectively a, uh, a system which allows us to schedule workloads across multiple, many Kubernetes clusters, think tens, maybe even hundreds. Uh, users effectively submit a, a job specification saying, I'd like to run this job. It needs this many CPU, maybe this many GPU, this much RAM, this much disk, access to certain data. Um, they submit it to the Armada API, and then the Armada application is responsible for effectively turning that into a pod which runs on a Kubernetes cluster or a collection of pods, which runs on um, uh, Kubernetes clusters under, under the covers. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you, Jay. Uh, put a link in the chat for more about Armada. Um, and then just here around what we're now seeing uh, from bare metal. So um, I'd say it is still early days in the main. We've been historically mostly using virtualization, but now we're moving to bare metal as a sort of de facto baseline to put everything on top of. Um, what we have seen so far is generally increased stability, especially for GPU intensive workloads. Uh, we had had a bunch of problems which ended up transpiring to be related to um, uh, confusion within the virtualization layer, I guess you could summarize it as. Um, we're definitely seeing better um, throughput between nodes on the network level um, and with external resources. Uh, I guess it, it, I know it's kind of possible to do a lot of tuning within VM, but it's certainly just a lot easier just to eliminate that extra layer and just go direct to the resources you need. Um, for us, it's allowed um, BGP peering to be a lot easier as well. And just generally, we have, um, uh, sorry, I've got a bit of background noise there from someone. Um, better bin packing for us. We, we tend to have larger nodes with bare metal. It just means we have less fragmentation of our estate. And as a result as well, simpler estate management. We have fewer layers between um, our workloads and our hardware. Uh, next slide, please. And then limitations, because it's obviously not all good news. Uh, there's some things which we, uh, you know, aren't as good, I suppose, on bare metal. So certainly you get slower provisioning time. I suppose that's not unexpected. You're actually booting a real computer as opposed to just spinning up a virtual machine or a container. Um, for us now, we need a little bit more precise quota management. We can't be quite as fast and loose with packing VMs onto things or maybe oversubscribing CPU. Um, we're slightly less flexible in some ways. There are some features of virtualization which we just don't have with bare metal, which we need to implement other ways, such as uh, snapshotting VMs, for example. Um, and we've also found it, it can be tricky for us to mix and match VMs and, and bare metal. So we've just found it's easier just to start from scratch and just build new clusters on the on sort of new architecture with bare metal and de gradually deprecate um, virtual ones. 
Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, summary from uh, from here really is that primarily GR is now using bare metal for our high performance workloads um, through Kubernetes. We do, do still make a lot of use of virtualization where it's appropriate. And where we are using bare metal, OpenStack ironic is our metal as a service of choice. And I think that's it. So if anyone has any questions. Thanks a lot, Scott and Jamie. Um, I, I guess there are like plenty of questions. Yeah, um, Jay. so I um, actually work with you all. So it's nice to see you. It's nice to save us time. We have an internal meeting about how G Research uses um, Ironic. But I was curious, um, kind of thinking about integrations, right? Like y'all say you're still using virtual machines for some things, and it's clear that the majority of the machines you're provisioning via Ironic are for Kubernetes. Um, have you ever considered, uh, like, have you ever considered, or is there a deeper integration between those? Like, um, for instance, I know that like Metal Aid exists, but it probably doesn't exactly fit the use case. Or, you know, like, do you provision your hypervisors for the VM side via Ironic? Like, how do those things kind of mesh together? I guess the focus of this presentation was mostly around sort of Kubernetes on Ironic, but actually we do use Ironic for a whole bunch of other things with the organization. Um, so for example, our big data stack, I believe is making quite heavy use of it um, and databases, as you say as well. Um, what we might find though over time is we've got a general desire to run as many things on Kubernetes as possible and make Kubernetes kind of like the substrate for our data center. So as more of those other technologies end up themselves running on Kubernetes, then maybe that'll be a more appropriate time to look at a tighter coupling between the bare metal service and Kubernetes itself. But for the moment, yeah, we're there sort of deliberately different things, I suppose. Yeah, and just on the note about um, building hypervisors with Ironic, it's not something we do currently, but it's something we're looking at doing kind of the next, well, sort of by the end of the year sort of roadmap. Because, um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it'll be really ideal for us. Um, when we sort of built the OpenStack uh, platform, we used another internal sort of build system um, that we have, um, and we just, it, it'd, be, it'd make sense for us to kind of migrate over to um, Ironic now that it's kind of, uh, getting a lot of usage can we kind of practice what we preach I guess any other questions yeah I mean I'm just I'm just gonna say the reason I was asking that is I know that um with ironic we kind of have been thinking about other integrations and stuff and so it uh we should chat sometimes about like what uh what your wishes would be along that because it could be a uh, fun input to those discussions <laughs> More questions before I start. <laughs> uh, I saw early on when you do configuration of your system that you boot to a pixie image. Has there been any thought of trying to migrate that functionality to do as much outside the box as possible as a, in, in lieu of actually booting to a, to a small image to do additional configuration? Uh, well, we use deploy steps. Um, so they, they do it out of band. Um, mm -hmm. but it still needs to. It still needs to boot into the, the round. I'm, I'm listening. Uh, the the reason I ask is, uh, I, I, it looks like one of the things you do with that pixie image is you set up bio settings, and there are out of band interfaces to manage that, like using Redfish. Yeah. So sorry for the bio settings. Well, that's done via deploy steps, and that's all out of band. Okay. Yeah. Scott, Scott, for the for the recycling, you said like um, you recycle all the nodes every twenty eight or thirty days, something like this. What's the, what's the failure rate in terms of like the node does not come back from that cycle, like like screen yeah. failed or uh, so? How often uh, do you have to step in and like manually kick nodes? Yeah, it's an interesting subject at the moment. Um, we are. This is kind of what what is kind of work in progress at the moment. Um, I've actually got two meetings after this about that um, <laughs> particular question. Um, I guess in, yeah, I, it's going to get better over time. And there's, there's, we're having lots of transient issues and stuff at the moment, like things that we kind of need to just work out why they fail and um, kind of uh, make some configuration tweaks on things failing halfway through and then not, it not being picked up like by Ironic that that's actually failed. And it kind of just sits there indefinitely. Um, so there's there's little things like that that we do need to get out of the way. Um, I mean, ask me that question again in a couple of months, and I'll okay. give you a, a much better answer. But yeah, it's kind of something that's being what what uh, works like cross team between like some of our customers and us because it's definitely a new thing that we want to be able to do. Yeah, 
Right. Yeah, I mean, for, from our point of view, the, the plan is really to have effectively completely rolling automated rebuilds. So we already have some automation which is able to, uh, within our Kubernetes estate, identify nodes which are have drifted from the desired configuration because something's moved on in, say, GitHub, or they're just older than a threshold, you know, approaching 28 days. And then we effectively have a process to cordon nodes, wait for them to drain, or even forcibly do it if jobs are preemptible, and then run that automation to then talk to Ironic, rebuild the nodes, put them back in the farm. So we, as Scott says, basically we need that fundamental operation of rebuilding a node to be as reliable as possible, and then we just automate on top of that. But certainly the desire is to have sort of, I don't know, five nines kind of uh, availability and reliability of that service, and that's what we're working towards. The main purpose of this cycle is basically to keep all the nodes on the same level. It's there's a few purposes. One, I suppose, is to reduce our actual operations. And mm -hmm. you know, at the moment we have quite a lot of click ops. If you want to rebuild a machine, someone has to choose to do it. Really, when you're managing a very large estate, we want to just set the desired state in GitHub and just trust that it will be tending towards that. And also have automated tests that prove that everything's still working. Um, also, it's just a sort of, I guess ensure that we're eliminating any kind of gremlins like you know all, a lot of stuff in computer science often boils down to turn it off and on again and really if you can make sure that's being automated from the ground up then you kind of eliminate a lot of those problems right. possibly you might actually end up this this is something we'll find out i think personally i think we might end up masking some of those problems because we're sort of doing that thing so effectively and actually sometimes running something for a long time really allows you to draw out those kinds of bugs but if it's not a problem and, and, and actually physically just rebuilding everything every 28 days automatically makes that go away then who cares? Right, exactly. That's the kind of driver, though. Okay. I would yeah, because I was thinking like, that, sorry, Jay. I was just going to say, I think you hit it on the nose that you are avoiding a lot of problems because I know that there are, um, in a lot of the hardware I've run ironic on, there was a history of where, like, if the BMC didn't receive a command for 60 or 90 days, it would sometimes just fall offline and things like that. And by rebuilding them and like touching those machines every 28 days, you are probably avoiding a world of hurt that, like, is, uh, it's sort of it's sort of interesting to see like how the requirements of G research like specially enable that kind of workflow, which helps things work more smoothly with Ironic. You also have a lot better assurance of your configuration because you know it's being, you know, flexed all the time, and you're actually right. building stuff constantly. Whereas you know you're not finding stuff's been checked into master and then realizing it's broken four months later or something like that. Right. I was just thinking that like in order to like keep this the the configuration the same everywhere, like sending a node through a full clean and rebuild sounds like a quite heavy operation to to achieve this. Is what I was asking. Mm. Rather I mean, than so we don't do this at the moment, um, not even for our batch nodes, but we probably could. Um, but of course, I mean, we have the issue that you know sometimes we have like hypervisors, for instance, provisioned by Ironic uh, or through through OpenStack and Ironic that are with us for a couple of years and they basically have never been reinstalled. Of course, the configuration is like kept up to date, but you know, for instance, if they haven't been rebooted, they still run an older kernel or they may accumulate some craft as you Exactly. So it's quite interesting. Dimitri, you have a question? Yeah, uh, are you doing or interested in doing firmware upgrades as part of your ready state preparation? Uh, so we currently do them through via cleaning step. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty slow, um, but yeah, um, it'd be nice to, I mean, if we do it as a provisioning, wouldn't that slow down provisioning quite a, quite, quite a lot? Um, where if we're doing it on the way out, then it kind of makes, I don't know, to me, it makes a little bit more sense because then the users just hand it back to the machine and then rather than just waiting around for, for um, a firmware update uh, on provision. Are you doing it inbound or through Redfish or anything like that? Uh, we do it in band, uh, so we pull down the RPMs and then we just uh, run those. Scott, there's no Redfish at do research. You're not using Redfish at all yet, right? Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, uh, are yeah. Doing? We use the Arlo driver, which basically uses Redfish to check power state and mm -hmm. turn the machine on and off, all that kind of thing. One other question I had is about your clean steps. When you had like the nice list of clean steps. I was wondering which of these are like like downstream clean steps versus upstream, because for instance the GPU the GPU check for instance is not upstream. Uh, I know this, but all the others I think could be. So I was wondering which of these are actually like homemade things. Versus... Um, I think the ones I listed. Uh, let me just double check. Yeah, I forgot to note on the slides. One second. You had like like. Um, What's that? Disk cleaning, burn. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we've got updating firmware, which is us, um, verifying ILO settings, uh, 
you. Yeah, I'm not sure, too sure about that one. Um, yeah, the hardware clock is awesome again, I think. Yeah, this uh, is figuring the RAID and wiping the hard disks, uh, we've kind of forked how that works because we use like a um, appliance to basically encrypt hard drives. So um, I think, yeah, we kind of briefly spoke about that before. Um, so it kind of extends uh, using like our own hardware manager because um, it's kind of a little bit special and um, is kind of a little bit to how GR does things. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not, I mean, yeah, it's not a great deal of that. We probably could be upstream. And then the check, check GPU health, um, like that basically is not actually running live yet. That's in our dev environment. But okay. what it does is it essentially runs, a, like uh, Jamie's guys came up with a binary that basically checks the health of a GPU when they um, when they start the machine up. Mm -hmm. So they just basically threw that over to us and said, oh, can you run this as a clean step rather than every time they boot a machine and then they go and test it, it's kind of too late and it's a little bit, like as I said in the in the presentation, you get to like the further down the line you get, the more like expensive operationally it is to actually get the node back out. So by marking it as a clean step, um, yeah, I mean we could we could look at something like uh, up, upstream in that. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be very sure. interesting because we're like ramping up our usage of GPUs as well, yeah. and we were just um, looking into like like you know health check or burn in, but we haven't done anything yet. Yeah, so burn, burn in is definitely an area where I'd like to extend um, and include the GPUs because it's kind of a it's a bit of a blind spot at the moment. You don't you kind of burn in the CPUs and the GPU and everything, and then you 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 start an instance up and you check that node export is there, but no one's actually touched the GPU until either that clean cycle is run with that enabled or right. the user's actually got the machine. So yeah, there's definitely um, there's definitely room for improvement there, but at least there's kind of the foundations in place with the kind of burning stuff for the CPU and everything that it's quite easy to extend and then we can just, yeah. But um, I guess that's where Jay comes in really. Uh, so Jay's on our open source team. Um, very good, very that, good. I'll keep him busy with that. Looking forward to that. <laughs> and I'm sitting over here just celebrating because it sounds like y'all have a really good setup using a lot of the surface area of Ironic in the right ways. And it's like, it. Uh, it's just exciting to hear like y'all just pulled it off the shelf and started using it this way because uh, this in terms of features is like um, one of the most fully featured ironic build outs that like I've seen in terms of like hardware management and stuff like that. And that's the part that I cared the most about when I was developing uh, full time here. So that's uh, that just makes me really happy to hear that. And like, I don't know, maybe y'all hear that at Bare Metal SIG all the time. And I'm just now getting in on the love, but uh, I appreciate hearing all that. I heard of some interesting feature usage in Berlin that uh, some amazed some of us like we had no idea <laughs> um which i guess is you know a testament to how flexible and powerful it is but i want to take a quick step backwards uh i'm unfortunately joined late because of the word meeting but i heard the magical words disk encryption <laughs> mm -hmm. um it sounds like you're using an appliance and it's part of your hardware manager it would be interesting to collaborate upstream on adding some sort of uh, hardware unlock capability. I know there's uh, some other or other organizations and I guess partner efforts that where they want to see disk encryption as a fully fledged feature, but also there are um, there are a number of things that they want to achieve. And I don't know if it's necessarily a thing and ironic, but they do also want to do attestation, which means an entire workflow interaction in the end. So it's one of those things that might be interesting to at least discuss upstream and see if maybe there's a uh, point of commonality, I guess it's where I'm kind of trying to hope for. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we push back quite a lot of stuff, with, especially with Colo Ansible. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's certainly something that we can, can work, work together with. I think in their case, they also want to support this for Windows as well, <laughs> which is uh, surprising, but we'll see where it goes. I have one more question. Sorry. I Thanks, no. Sergio. I have one more question with, with, uh, with respect to flavors, because you said, like, basically, flavors encrypt the availability zone as well. Well, encrypt. They, they carry the information about the availability zone. So does that mean that, like, you have every, for every hardware type that you have, you have, like, three flavors? I mean, how no, many flavors the, do you have is basically the question. The, the flavor has the resource class. Right. 
And then the availability zone and the network is the thing that um, specifies where in the data center that it will end up. Right, but this is, so in, the, this is in the resource class as well. No, no, it's not. Ah, okay. So when you when you when you say like in Horizon, you drop down and click um, the the flavor that would, all that would have really is a resource class, and then you okay. have a availability zone is another drop down. Okay, okay, that, right. and then the the networks the provider networks are kind of tied to right. an availability zone. So you'd have to be a bit smart with the way you do that. So we just label them like AZ one. Okay. <laughs> Quite analogous to what you'd see in AWS, really. The flavoring codes, like the qualities of the machine itself, like CPU. Right. RAM and that kind of stuff, but where it is and what network you use is just a different. Right. You have you have requirements for more fine grained scheduling than availability zone. Like for instance, I have to have this specific instance in this specific rack. Is that a something that you have? Because this is a requirement that I just faced with from from our Ceph guys, because they they want to make sure that like specific servers are in specific racks rather than they create instances and then reshuffle things according to where they landed. I don't, I don't know, is that, is that a requirement you ever faced? It is, but we kind of achieve that through Kubernetes more. So I guess my team's responsible for making sure we have clusters in all the places we need clusters. And then we label and taint nodes um, properly so that we can okay. sort of advertise to people what's where. And then we can choose the work, you know, workloads can choose if they care where to run. Um, and something we haven't done yet, but are starting to work on, for example, is like what you say around like rack affinity. And, you know, we've got certain very high performance workloads that want to have some kind of affinity to the same switch. We want to be able to schedule a bunch of GPU jobs, say that could talk, we know need to be able to talk to each other very fast. So we'd want to, to schedule them all on the same rack. Um, then you've got challenges around like, you know, preemption and how to actually get there and not have to be really inefficient and wait for it to be free or, you know, have large amounts of farm just sitting idle. So that you can achieve that whenever you want it. So it's, it's complicated, but yeah. But hopefully that answers the question. Cool. Yep. Thanks. Are there any more questions? I know um, some yeah. of the folks at uh, some of the US national labs have struggled with rack affinity as well for some other HPC workloads. But generally, those users seem to not really use uh, Nova. They're using more declarative inventories where they have an absolute configuration they're pushing out. Thanks. Yeah, we'd like to move away from a position, or we'd like to not be in a position where we have to make people too aware of specific racks. We want people to be able to say, if they have that requirement, then they can schedule their workload on you know, servers which are effectively local to each other without them having to understand the topology of the data center. That, right. that is a huge value add uh, for just using the software because I've had that same challenge uh, in cloud environments for years. Yeah. Where, oh, I scheduled it. It deployed. Oh, wow. It's definitely our side of the data center. Yeah, this is slow. Yeah, exactly. Do we have more questions? I guess I'm kind of curious just to ask like, um, is there anything that's been missing? Right. Like, it seems like y'all covered a lot of the hardware management, like, surface area that ironic provides has there been something other that's not like harbor specific like you already said something about some of your custom hardware managers but has there ever been a place where you're like does ironic do this and then you were disappointed that we didn't or like kind of the the feature that we don't have that you wish we did uh yeah that's a yeah that's a good question i don't know really yeah i can't nothing springs to mind i don't know about you jamie you're more of an end user so yeah i guess i could have a couple i mean nothing major i think from my point of view it seems that sometimes it takes longer than i would expect to maybe put a new flavor in i don't know if that's the side effect of our particular automation or it sometimes feels like ironic is quite opinionated about what kind of hardware can be run in it although for us it becomes less of a problem as more of our hardware becomes sort of more standard and homogenous um, in particular, we, because we're going on this migration uh, from sort of Windows to Linux and at the same time expanding our estate, the new stuff we buy all tends to be the same sort of shape and size, so it fits in nicely. But what we also have is a large legacy estate of all sorts of shapes and sizes, so we need to work out how to fit that in nicely, and it's not always trivial to do that. Um, the other thing, and a very specific thing, which I think, again, is not ironic um, thing, is that we... On virtual machines, on Kubernetes, we make quite heavy use of Cinder for um, PVCs, for um, block storage. 
that doesn't, I don't think that's a feature that's available within Ironic. So we need to find a slightly different way of achieving that. We've kind of sidestepped it for the moment because actually most of the workloads that run on bare metal Kubernetes don't feed PVCs at all. So it isn't a problem. They tend to use remote storage. But over time, as we move everything to um, Ironic and, and, Kubernetes, and through Kubernetes, we're going to need to solve that. Um, so that's that will be the only couple of things that spring to mind. Did you say Ceph or just Cinder in general? Uh, well, both. I mean, for us, we're using Cinder as the interface, I suppose, and Ceph as the actual um, data storage system behind the scenes. OK, because the reason I ask is because supposedly, in, supposedly, sorry, in Wallaby, I believe, um, if you send iSCSI connection information to a Cinder uh, or to Cinder, to oh. attach a volume, then you get ice because of connection information back. However, I believe the Ceph community is moving away from having an ice because gateway. So it might be a short lived capability. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have other options, things we've explored. We are even able to run storage on the Kubernetes nodes, but we're sort of trying to avoid doing that if at all possible. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's not a major problem at the moment. It's just something we need to solve. Okay, any more questions, comments? That's not the case. Thanks a lot again, Scott and Jamie, for being with us today.